Okay, uh, for our first slide, um, I will go ahead and introduce them. Um, so, Shannon Davis, uh, Digital Library Services Manager at Washington University in St. Louis, and Joel Miner, Curator of Modern Literature Collection and Manuscripts, also at Washington University in St. Louis, will be doing their presentation, The James Miro Digital Archive, Channeling the Collaborative Spirits. And I'll hand it over to them. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, my name is Joel Miner, and I'll be starting off the talk today. Um, the James Merrill Digital Archive Channeling Collaborative Spirits. And I am going to um, be talking about some background on James Merrill, his literary archive at Washington University, and the materials we are using on his website. Okay, so James Ingram Merrill was born in 1926, and he was the son of Charles Merrill, co founder of Merrill Lynch and Helen Plummer a former professional reporter and a Southern debutante. James Merrill devoted his life mainly to writing. He published 16 books of poetry, two novels, three plays, a memoir, and a book of essays. Merrill is considered one of the most significant poets of the latter half of the 20th century. He was known as a master of lyric and formless poetry early in his career, and then of epic narrative poetry, which is the phase the digital archive is a part of. He was and still is praised for his stylish elegance, moral sensibilities, and transformation of autobiographical moments into deep and complex meditations. Common themes in his poetry include memory, nostalgia, loss, limitations, and revisions of self, and the interplay of autobiography and archetype. He won every major poetry award in his career and was chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. The images here are from the James Merrill papers. On the left is Jimmy at uh, age four, uh, around 1930. And on the right is his bronze death mask from 1995 when he died. I chose these two to illustrate the James Merrill papers as what we call a cradle to grave archive. In other words, it chronicles his whole life, not just his writing life. So how did Washington University end up with all of this? Well, in, in summary, uh, it started in 1964 when Merrill started sending us his manuscripts that his good friend and fellow poet, Mona Van Dyne, requested of him. The, the Washington University Library Special Collections were building the Modern Literature Collection at that time, and Merrill was one of the first 15 poets that they sought for the collection, which now houses primary and secondary materials from over 175 authors, presses, and journals. Merrill had no other connection to Washington University except his close friendship with Van Dyne and her husband Jarvis Thurston, a Washington University English professor. Merrill said in an interview years later that he agreed to send them to Washington University because they sent a personal invitation in contrast to the formal and personal ones he received from other libraries. He continued donating to us until his death in 1995 and his mother donated more after that. The collection has grown to 310 boxes or 17 and a half linear feet and we continue to acquire correspondence and other materials from his many friends and acquaintances. He also left us his literary copyright and an endowment for building uh, um, upon his and other literary manuscript collections. So now a little bit about the Ouija board and the Book of Ephraim. Uh, pictured here are Merrill and his partner David Jackson and Jackson is on the left. The two started using the Ouija board in the early 1950s. The start of their relationship really coincided with their mutual interest in it. Merrill's first poem to reference the Ouija board was Voices from the Other World, published in 1959 in the country of a thousand years of peace, Merrill's third volume of poems. But it wasn't until 17 years later that he revealed the extent of his Ouija board seances with the Book of Ephraim, an epic which comprises over half the book Divine Comedies published in 1976. Book of Ephraim had many false starts as a novel, but after losing the manuscript more than once, he turned it into a 26-part narrative poem, one part for each letter of the alphabet. The narrative is basically about Merrill and Jackson being guided via the Ouija board by a first century Greek Jew named Ephraim, presented as a series of conversations spanning 20 years, where the dead mingle with the living, we are introduced to an afterlife world where spirits act as patrons for the living. The living in turn serve as the spirits' representatives on earth. 
In one section of the poem, Merrill expresses his own doubts about these revelations, and in turn, his own sanity. But he commits himself to the concept with episodes of personal history and personal flaws, uncovering hidden archetypal stories for the reader. With Divine Comedy's end book of Ephraim, his poetry moved from formalism to more uh, conversational style, in other words, lyric to narrative, and so is considered his breakthrough into a new artistic phase. Divine Comedies, which besides Book of Ephraim include, included two other poems referencing Ouija board seances, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1977. Two more Ouija books uh, soon followed, Maribel Books of, of Number, which earned him his second National Book Award, and then Scripts for the Pageant. And these introduced many more characters with each book based upon an aspect of the Ouija board and going higher up into the spirit world. All three combined into the book, The Changing Light at Sandover in 1982, with a new coda and totaling 560 pages. And this book won the National Book Critics Circle Award. So these books were taken uh, very seriously by critics and many readers, perhaps partly because Merrill was following a long tradition of renowned poets and writers communing with spirits or muses or visiting the afterlife or other world to uncover mysteries of the universe and existence. And I'll just name some of the most famous examples uh, of this trend, uh, going back to Homer, Dante, Milton, John Keats, William Blake, Edgar Allan Poe, Victor Hugo, and William Butler Yeats. The James Merrill Digital Archive got started because of the popularity of the Ouija board manuscripts, which include seance transcripts, extensive notes, poetry drafts, as well as a homemade Ouija board, which you saw on the previous slide. Scholars and students want to look at these materials quite regularly. For example, Washington University English professor Joseph Lowenstein teaches the Book of E from every year in a class titled Literary Modernities, which examines major works of literature going back to the early 17th century. He brings his students to see the manuscripts so he knows of their potential for more deeply understanding the poem. And Dr. Lowenstein is also co-director of the Humanities Digital Workshop, which is partnership between faculty, students, and staff on digital humanities projects. Dr. Lowenstein proposed the project as part of the HDW's annual summer workshop in 2013, and he continues to serve as its main faculty advisor and advocate. And now Shannon Davis will talk about the project itself. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joel. Um, so as Joel said, the project began as part of the Humanities Digital Workshops Annual Summer Workshop. Um, and during this six-week workshops, um, students, undergraduates, and graduates work with um, faculty and for the last couple of years embedded librarians to work on digital humanities projects. Um, so they receive basic training in many areas of digital humanities, including data entry, XML encoding, data visualization, and research and um, digital library services, which is now actually called scholarly publishing, um, the unit that I work in. We've been collaborating on these projects for several years. Um, and so the training that students get in the HEW summer workshop, along with um, supervision from staff in my department and the input we can give them, allows us to leverage their skills to develop really forward thinking projects. So uh, all of these different groups um, of people at the university joined together and we started the James Merrill Digital Archive collaboration which we're still working on today. So these are some of the uh, main areas that collaborators focused on um, during the project and are still focusing on. Um, so the project remains extremely collaborative. Sometimes it requires more student time, sometimes more staff time. Um, the planning and infra infrastructure is really taken care of by staff. Um, and then we kind of rely on students to execute um, the project plan that we lay out. Um, and then we provide oversight and direction for them as they work on it. Um, we also meet pretty regularly to discuss progress and generate new ideas and agree on best practices for encoding or um, what direction the project is gonna take for that um, summer or semester. Um, we meet pretty frequently um, with our faculty sponsor, um, Professor Lowenstein, that Joel mentioned, um, just to make sure that we're still on the right track for his ideas for the collection as well. 
And um, some of these activities, even though I put them in categories, they do tend to overlap a little bit. Um, we draw on each group's strengths and expertise and have been able to create a really cohesive working group, even though we have a lot of um, student turnover. Um, but it, we've been able to pretty seamlessly work on this project for the last few years. So starting in summer 2013, we had one undergraduate and one graduate student working on the initial project. So their job for the summer was to scan hundreds of pages of Merrill's writings, and they used an ATIS Pro book scanner, an overhead scanner. Um, they cropped the images and then processed them to create access copies for the website. And students also created metadata for the images. Um, at that time, we were using an InfoPath SharePoint form that you can see on the right, but we've since changed our process a little bit. Um, but this is kind of what they were working with that first summer. And then um, we delivered and still do deliver the project through Omeka digital exhibit software that was uh, developed at George Mason University. It's free and open source. Um, we host an instance of Omeka here at WashU, but you can also have Omeka host your exhibits if you want to do it that way. Um, so I set up the initial Omeka exhibit and then trained students to ingest the images and metadata as objects in Omeka or items. Um, and then the project team agreed on some sections to organize the exhibit initially. Um, the students that we had working on the project that first summer were uh, in the English department and were interested and knowledgeable about Merrill's work. So we used their knowledge and Joel's expertise of the subject matter to organize the content in a way that we felt was useful for researchers. So these were the sections of the exhibit that we initially came up with. So we have the Book of Ephraim um, that contained all of the materials towards that poem. We have the original VG transcripts that um, Merrill and his partner just wrote down um, all of the things that Ephraim the Spirit was telling them through the Ouija board. And then we had the Maryland process section, which one of um, the graduate student that was working that summer um, tried to put Merrill's writings in order, um, the way that he revised them, kind of showing the progression of his writing. And over time, um, we revised the site so that that top section that was the Book of Ephraim now became the Merrill Archive. So this is now all of the archival materials towards the Book of Ephraim. Um, Maryland Process became a fuller composition history of Merrill's work and is arranged to show progression in his writing. And so it's not necessarily an archival order, it's in the order that we feel expresses um, his revision and writing style. So uh, for this section, graduate students working with Joel arranged the materials according to how Merrill edited his work and how drafts of the poem progressed over time. Uh, Merrill process was also just originally images and metadata, but now we have um, TEI encoded transcripts of the drafts and um, fragments and notes. So once these sections were in place, uh, we worked on populating them with content. Um, this material is pretty unique compared to other digital exhibits that we had. We don't have anything that is really as extensive that shows an entire archival collection. Um, and Omeka wasn't really made, uh, the, the built-in layouts weren't really made to show an art entire, entire archival collection. Um, it's really designed to show a curated exhibit, so we had to modify Omeka a little bit to ensure that navigation was clear and users could view the materials easily. So um, the design, if you're familiar with Omeka, this probably doesn't look like a typical theme either. So we customized the theme, uh, modifying the style sheets and um, PHP files to give it an interesting look and feel. Um, and also customize the navigation and use some plugins to enhance the functionality. So we created an accordion JavaScript menu to navigate the Ouija transcripts and the Merrill archive sections just because they contain so much content. So this is the Ouija transcript section and you can see it contains many, many folders that won't even fit on the screen. So we had to figure out a way to show those um, in an organized way. Um, so the materials are arranged by archival box and folder number. And for this menu, um, so the way that I customized the navigation was choosing a text-only layout in Omeka and then 
Um, from there, you can use HTML and JavaScript to um, create a custom menu. So this is what you see when you go um, initially to the Ouija transcript section, and then when you click on a folder number, it expands and then shows the metadata for that particular folder. Um, and within that, if you click on view folder 2955, for example, um, you can see the entire folder of images. Um, and that is displayed using the Internet Archives book reader, which is a Mecca plugin that we used for the exhibit. So all of this was basically the first year of work on um, the Merrill Digital Archives. So the scanning and metadata and creating the exhibit really took up a lot of the time. Um, and this is the Internet Archive book reader uh, that allows you to just kind of flip through the materials page by page. So since that initial year, um, once we got a lot of content online, um, we were thinking about what the next step in this pro um, project would be. So um, students and staff have been, um, since then, working on OCR and correcting and encoding Merrill's writings in TEI XML. So um, my unit provided a TEI document model so that students could begin encoding section A of the Book of Ephraim. So as Joel mentioned, it's laid out in 26 sections by each letter of the alphabet. Um, so once I provided the document model, students were able to use their knowledge of the materials to kind of fine tune what TEI elements we would use to, um, you know, me not being familiar with this material, they were able to kind of um, make the TEI a little more useful for uh, what we were encoding. So we used elements and attributes to describe each medium that Merrill used for writing and editing. He used pen, pencil, and different colors of marker. Um, and we also tried to describe his intentions when editing, so um, strike through, addition, overwritten. And then we also included um, zoning, so that, um, for instance, if the, the bottom image, the top part in pencil would be a zone, and then the typewritten part would be a zone, so we can kind of better organize pages where Merrill wrote in all the available space, and you would tend to write in different angles. Um, so here, the encoding at the top represents just these two lines in the poem. So as you can see, it was a pretty tedious process, um, very extensive encoding. Um, so once the students kind of got a good feel for this, they created an encoding guidelines document with all of the um, elements and attributes that future encoders could use to refer to. And the first summer, students completed sections A and B. Um, we used uh, subversion versioning software to keep track of our files and avoid confusion among a lot of contributors. And we used this through um, Oxygen XML has um, subversion built into it, so we use that through Oxygen. Um, and students also document the work they do so that um, because we have so much student turnover, we're able to pick up where um, previous students left off. So from here, we incorporated the TI files into the Maryland process section, and then people can view the transcript along with a page image like you see here. So using that zoning functionality, um, we're able to use the, um, that zoning information. So when you roll over a zone, um, it's an image on the left, it highlights in the transcript on the right. And we were also able to incorporate a magnifier um, so that, you know, the image on the left is a little bit hard to read, but you can use the magnifier to um, roll over it and kind of see the text up close. And uh, our colleagues in the Humanities Digital Workshop um, made, created that functionality for us. So in summer 2016, this past summer, before students and embedded librarians started work on the summer workshop, we all, the project team, all gathered together to set priorities. Um, we agreed because we only had sections A and B up at this point, adding content was really our main priority. So um, because of this, encoding was scaled down, and we just uh, decided to use the basic structural elements and minimal description of Merrill's editing process. We didn't want to go fully in depth um, just to get more content onto the site. So using a more streamlined version of the encoding guidelines, students were able to complete galley proofs for every section, A through Z, and um, all materials for sections A through I. So this is section I at this point. Um, so now we have nine sections on the site after the summer where there were previously only two. 
So going forward, um, our emphasis is on increasing the amount of content available on the site. And um, once we have the content up, we plan to go back and enhance the encoding of the sections where we scaled it down this past summer. Um, so we can include the more complex markup that we initially intended. So this collaboration has been a great learning experience for all of us um, and really reinforced how useful talented students can be in delivering quality digital projects. By leveraging their technical skills and topical knowledge along with faculty and staff expertise, we've been able to create um, a really useful teaching and learning resource. And I think we'll take questions. Thank you, Shannon and Joel. Um, moderating questions here. Um, first question we have, you had your students um, create XML encoding for the, the papers. Were they using um, the XML view or where they were actually typing in XML code or were they using more of a form view where they didn't have to type the XML tags? Uh, so we had the students use um, the document model that I created was just kind of the basic structure um, for the poem and uh, then they kind of took over and populated that so they were actually writing XML um, at that point and we use Oxygen XML editor um, but after um, as I said in the, the HDW summer workshop they get some basic training in XML so they kind of are familiar with it um, once we started this project and so they were able to really dive in and actually write in the XML instead of using like a WYSIWYG editor. I do have a question for you Shannon and Joel. Um, what did you, so you've done a lot of encoding in TI. Um, are you creating a new website to be able to show that TI document in a way that's aesthetically pleasing for someone who goes to that website and read those texts that you've transcribed? Um, yeah, so uh, we're using, um, I believe TEI Display is the, um, it's not exactly an Omeka plugin, but it's something you can use with Omeka to um, display TEI as um, plain text, basically. Um, and it has a style sheet with it, so you can modify. Um, so, for instance, in, in this transcript, um, the blue is actually where Mer Merrill had written in blue pen, um, and the purple at the top, the same thing. Um, so that's kind of how we're using the TEI. Um, we are transitioning digital repositories right now. Um, so probably Omeka isn't the ideal solution to deliver this content, um, but we kind of had to work with it while we're in transition period. Um, we're moving to a hydro repository right now, so it's possible that in the future, you know, we'll make use of the TEI in that hydro repository and it, it might look a little different. Um, last question, what was the steepest learning curve in this entire project? Hmm. Um, it probably depends on who you would ask. Me personally, not, you know, I'm, I come from a digital library background, not archives or literature. So for me, getting familiar with the material was the sharpest learning curve. Um, probably for the students, the TEI, I would think. Uh, surely have any. Yeah, I was also the TEI um, with that technical aspect to um, marking up the, the, the drafts that, as Shannon pointed out, as this screen points out, has so many challenges for how best to um, uh, translate it into TEI. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Allison, I have another question here too. This is Amanda. Yeah. Um, Shannon and Joel, uh, what are, you said you were in a transition period. So is that because you're adding new features or adding uh, new things to your workflow or et cetera, or enhancing it in some way? Um, more transitioning between um, digital asset management systems. Um, so that's one technical hurdle we have to get over. Um, the the project itself i'd say we're pretty uh last summer when we decided to scale back the encoding and just push forward with getting more content online i think that's still our plan um, until we get all the sections finished and then we'll go back and do some of the more complex encoding that we initially had set out to do 
you know, we, we, we decided to do it in phases. Uh, so uh, doing the full dress first and then the, and, and the chance of the basic markup and then the fragments and the notes that are a little harder to decipher in place. And then the, the final step will be uh, working with graduate students on uh, pedagogical material of, because we want this material to obviously be useful in uh, the classroom and, and for scholars. Um, so we, we want to develop that as kind of the last step. Very nice. And we have another question that's come in via the chat. Um, can you tell us some more about the TEI training for this project? Um, sure, I can't speak about the um, initial XML training they get in the workshop. Um, I know it's just a, a, they usually do a half day pretty basic XML tutorial just so uh, students just kind of familiarize themselves with the structure of XML and um, you know how it works. Um, as far as the TEI training goes, um, there are a couple introductory TEI um, documents that we generally give students to read that um, I, you know, I read them when I started in this line of work too, and it's not exactly like you're going to pick up all the TEI in, that, in those two documents, but it gives you a little bit of background information. Um, and then we kind of sit down with them um, with the, the document model that we created so that has the basic structure for the document, so a header and the body, um, and for these, since they're poems, we have line groups and lines. Um, so once we have a basic document model, I can kind of go sit down with the students and explain to them what metadata goes in what elements in the header, what attributes to use, um, you know, what, what things, what elements and attributes are available in the TEI, so we can kind of, um, I guess it's more hands-on, one-on-one um, -on -one kind of tutorials at the very beginning just to kind of get them familiarized because the TEI is pretty expansive, so sitting down with them um, at the outset really, really helps. We've also, uh, in the last two summers, have um, utilized uh, extra help from um, uh, librarians. Uh, so the HDW has uh, provided the opportunity for a handful of librarians to work on different projects. And so I think that's helped as well with getting, um, so we have more of a team going uh, with the TEI markup. And um, so yeah, I think that's, that's helped with the students learning curve as well. Fabulous. Thank you guys so much for that. And we have another question coming in here. Um, in retrospect, what are some of the lessons you have learned and would you do anything differently? Um, yes, I think I would have started with the scaled down encoding at the very beginning. I, we were pretty ambitious with what we wanted to do. Um, and we're doing a lot of uh, not sure the word I'm looking for. Uh, we were trying to, I guess, interpretation. Um, yeah, I mean, you can see from this image on the left here that Meryl, his editing and revision style was kind of all over the place. Um, but we, you know, at the beginning, we're trying to interpret, okay, what does is, what is the purple marker mean? What does the blue pen mean? When, you know, was purple first, was blue second? And, um, I think we sacrificed getting content online because of the really ambitious work we were trying to do with analyzing his um, editing and revision and writing style. So I think I would have just started out with a little more basic encoding in order to really get more content onto the site at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I, I would really agree with that. Um, the, the manuscripts, the drafts themselves um, can be pretty disorganized. Uh, I've seen worse, but I've seen better. Um, and because it is such a, a, an epic long poem, uh, there are a lot of components. And so a, a little bit, yeah, I, I think um, if, if we had reached that conclusion that we did this summer that, that we need to, as Shannon said, get more basic content up first and enhance it as we go. Uh, I think we are kind of feeling our way a little bit, and with each summer, we had a different 
students working on it and, and leading it, the, the grad student in particular who would be leading it. And that, that helped a lot as far as um, getting uh, where we are to where we are now. Um, um, so, in, in from my perspective, I, I think, um, as Shannon said, a, a little bit more planning on, on the markup part, um, and then also maybe um, getting a, a, a firmer grasp on um, the organization of the manuscripts, which um, kind of falls on my end. Um, but uh, I mean, it's we're kind of learning as we go, and it's 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 been a lot of fun. I don't think there are any major regrets as far as we haven't had to scrap anything and, and do it over. So that's good. Um, we've just kind of been uh, feeling our way as far as how we want it to be displayed. So again, as you see on the screen, we've worked with um, staff in the Humanities Digital Workshop on uh, creating the magnifier and um, other aspects that we have you know, taken from other sites because that's something that we haven't really mentioned either. We, we've looked at other similar sites and their features. Um, so Walt Whitman has a website, um, Samuel Beckett and others, uh, similar scholarly sites that use drafts and TEI markup. And so we kind of uh, pick, pick and chose the, the, the features that we thought were best and that, that were most feasible and appropriate for our site. So, um, so that was an important aspect as well that um, we shouldn't know the book. Excellent, thank you. We've got a couple more questions in here. Um, do you have any recommendations for resources that library staff can use to learn how to do TEI encoding? Um, yes, I um, don't know, you know the URLs right at the top of my head, but there's a gentle introduction to the TEI. I think if you Google that, you'll probably find it. Um, and then there's a very gentle introduction to the TEI. Um, I wouldn't recommend necessarily going to uh, the TEI and you know reading through all the elements and attributes or anything, but their website is pretty informative. Um, I think for me personally, you know, reading that stuff does provide some background information, but um, actually coding was how I learned it. Doing the hands-on stuff really made more of a difference for me and I think it did for the students as well. Um, so yeah, I guess those, those three things I would recommend. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let's see, two more here. Uh, first one, what type of funding are you getting to sustain this project? Sorry, can you repeat the question? What type of funding are you using to sustain the project? Oh, um, we don't really have any funding. <laughs> so, um, Just magically appears. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we do share resources with with uh, with English in the libraries because, well, at least in uh, trying to get work done between the summer workshops, which we try to do uh, to keep momentum going. Uh, so we both chip in in that respect. Uh, but otherwise, it basically goes through the, the managed digital workshop, I believe. Yeah, so they, the HDW has funding for their summer workshop every year. Um, so they pay their um, undergraduates and graduates. So that, that really helps us make a lot of progress. Um, and as Joel mentioned, we have student workers during the year that we try to have contribute also so that you know we have a little bit of funding for that. But otherwise, it's just yeah, another, another part of our regular work day. So. Okay. That's great. Um, and let's see, the last one for now, what, with having a lot of turnover with students, um, how are you dealing with metadata consistency? Um, it is difficult. We did have one graduate student who stayed um, at least a year, maybe more. Um, so that was really helpful to have some consistency because you could really guide the project and train undergraduates. Um, the encoding guidelines document that the students wrote up um, a couple summers ago is really useful. Uh, we have a set of tags, um, elements, and attributes that they decided on. And so we're using those for now. You know, we may go back and revise them later, but. Um, having at least a set of guidelines so that we 
at least maintain some sort of consistency has been really important. What was the most fulfilling part of this project? Fulfilling? Yeah, the, the part that really, uh, let's see what we've got. Um, the part that really you found most rewarding or that really hit home the excitement of doing these kinds of digital projects? Well, I'll just start with it just speaking kind of a little bit of the abstract for me. I, I, as, as a curator of, of these manuscripts, um, uh, I, I didn't know much about this poem going in, uh, but I, I kind of grew in a, uh, have an affection for it, and I hope that this project will uh, widen uh, the appreciation of, of the work, and then also um, to widen the uh, awareness of, of um, manuscripts, and maybe particularly the literary manuscripts in, in um, uh, digital uh, projects. and. Um, so it's kind of been a, just a broad thing that I've gotten out of it. Well, yeah, I would second that. I didn't know anything about Merrill or this poem before we started this project. Um, so it's been really interesting, um, to learn about, you know, his process with the, the Ouija board and everything. And that I, I had no idea that he was such a well-renowned poet. So it's, it's been interesting to learn the background of that. Too. Very cool. Thank you. Now we're, we're running out of time and we have one, one last question. Um, have you applied TEI to other digital projects at your library? Yes, um, we actually have quite a bit of um, TEI collections. Um, so the reason that we're moving um, digital repositories is that we have been delivering all of our text collections, which are all encoded in TEI via um, DLXS that was developed at University of Michigan. Um, but it, they don't support it anymore. So um, we are moving all of our TEI collections into our new Hydra repository. Um, but basically, that, I would say that would be the bulk of our digital collections, our um, TEI encoded text with their corresponding page images or um, videos. As you see a couple sessions from now, um, we have the Eyes on the Prize videos with the, the corresponding transcripts are all encoded in TEI as well. Right. I'd just like to close by saying that, uh, you know, like, like to repeat again, this is a work in progress. So, you know, we would encourage you to keep your eye on it. Uh, there will be more content and changes and enhancements coming. And also one thing that we have talked about is sharing the TEI on the website. And I think that'll probably happen as we, you know, get through the whole alphabet and uh, uh, feel like we're at more of a complete stable stage with that. Um, so uh, keep an eye out uh, on it uh, for those kind of things. All right, wonderful. And we are now out of time. So we look forward to seeing you guys with part two next year. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to hand it back to Amanda and we're going to do the transition to our next session, um, Yellow Brick Road to Digitization. Thank you.